Orthodox Survival Course by Father Seraphim Rose and Father Podmashinsky. Lecture 11, Evolution, Part 3 out of 3. Dobzhansky. We'll look at one more Christian evolutionist before we come to the great prophet of our age. This one is, alas, a Russian Orthodox scientist. His name is Theodosius Dobzhansky, and he lives in Davis, California, last we heard. He teaches there genetics. In fact, I think he still has his fruit flies and is continuing to make experiments to prove evolution. He was born in the year of the canonization of St. Theodosius of Chernigov, in answer to prayer from his parents. And that's why he was called Theodosius. Alas, he became an apostate. He came to America in the 20s and has been an American since that time. And he's been absolutely prohibited in Soviet Russia although the Soviet scientists know about him. And once when a film was accidentally presented at one scientific meeting in Russia, which showed him on it, all the scientists cheered, and the film was withdrawn because he is non-existent, a non-person because he left Russia. But he thinks like a communist. He's so religious that when his wife died, he had her cremated, took the ashes and scattered them in the Sierras. As far as one can guess, he never goes to church. He's quite beyond religion. But for his great Christian evolutionist views, he was granted a doctorate of theology by St. Vladimir's Academy in New York. And he gave an address to, I think it's called, the Orthodox Theological Society of America. It has all the great theologians. Orthodox theologians of all the jurisdictions except ours. In America, they listened to him give his talk, which was printed in the Orthodox periodical called Concern, and it's called Evolution, God's Method of Creation. In this article, he says that anybody who says anything against evolution is a blasphemer, because that is the way God acts, and that's the way it is. He says in this article, Natural selection is a blind and a creative process. Natural selection does not work according to a foreordained plan. That is, where is God's providence if you are a Christian? He notes the extraordinary variety on life on the earth, but he says, What a senseless operation if it would be that God were to fabricate a multitude of species ex nihilo from nothing, and then let most of them die out. What is the sense of having as many as two or three million species living on the earth? Was the creator in a jocular mood when he did this? Was he playing practical jokes? No, he reasons. This organic diversity becomes, however, reasonable and understandable if the creator has created the living world not by gratuitous caprice, but by natural selection. It is wrong to hold creation and evolution as mutually exclusive alternatives. Well, what he means by that, it actually makes no difference if you have a god. And he makes two or three million species by means of natural selection. Isn't it just as silly as if he creates them all at once? Doesn't think straight and there's no plan to it. He says it's all just blind, a blind process. Of course, he is filled with the usual liberal Christian ideas that Genesis is symbolical, that man's awareness is the cause of the tragic meaninglessness in the world today, and the only escape is for man to realize that he can cooperate with the enterprise of creation willed by God. For participation in this enterprise makes mortal man part of God's eternal design. And he says, The most gallant and by far the most nearly successful attempt to do this, cooperate with God's eternal design, has been that of Teilhard de Chardin. So, 
we'll look into now this last evolutionist, who is the great evolutionist prophet of our times, Teilhard de Chardin. He died in 1955, about 70 years old, I believe. Student, buried in New York State, Father Seraphim. He was a paleontologist who was present at the discovery of many, most of the great fossil men of our century. It was he who took part with two other people in the discovery of the Piltdown Man. He discovered the tooth, which was dyed. It's not known whether he had a part in it. One of these men is accused of being the one who fabricated the Piltdown Man, and it's being hushed up that Tillard de Chardin had anything to do with it. But it's already known in the earlier books that he discovered the tooth. He was present at the new discoveries of Java Man, which were incidentally all locked up in a closet in Holland someplace, and not allowed to be examined again, while not at the very beginning. And there's a great mystery there because the leading man who discovered it dropped dead in the ditch one day. He, Tillyard, was also present when the fossils of Pecking Man disappeared for the last time. And so we have no fossils of Pecking Man left, and no casts were made. There's only some kind of drawings and models. But he is the one who is chiefly responsible for the interpretation of all these findings. And he himself said, no matter where I went, I continually found just the proof I was looking for, and he fit these together into the evidence for the proof of human evolution, which is so shaky that it's, well, we won't go into it now. But one writer has said, all the evidence for human evolution, all the skulls could be put into a single small coffin. And we just don't know what the relation is of these pieces to each other. This man, Tillyard de Chardin, is very remarkable because he is both a scientist and a mystic. And the surprising thing is not so much that he is that way because he was a Jesuit, after all, but that he is quite respected by the theologians, Roman Catholic theologians, and, in fact, by many Orthodox so-called theologians, and by scientists. In fact, this book, The Phenomenon of Man, has an introduction by Julian Huxley, who is the son of the, son or grandson, the son of the older Huxley T. H. Huxley, and is an absolute atheist, an atheist evolutionist. And he agrees with Teilhard de Chardin on everything except when he puts too much religion in. His attempt to reconcile Catholicism and evolution he felt was a little, he can't agree with everything there, but basically he agrees with his philosophy. This will bring us into territory which we discussed a little bit earlier. As you recall, the earlier scientists in the West, at the revival of modern science, actually the birth of modern science at the time of the Renaissance, were all mystically oriented. They were filled with Pythagorean philosophy, and Bruno himself was quite a mystical pantheist. The whole world is God. How God is the soul of the world. Again, we remember Saint Simon, the socialist prophet, who said the time is coming when not only the social order will be a religious institution, but science and religion also will come together and no longer will science be atheistic. Well, this is the one they were looking for, the one who brings together science and religion. Let's take one more quote from 19th century American philosopher Rolf Waldo Emerson, who talks about the very same thing, the restoration of unity in man since he faces a situation where man's faith has now been divorced from knowledge because of modern enlightenment, and how we can get back together faith and knowledge. He says this in his essay on nature. 
The reason why the world lacks unity and lies broken and in heaps is because man is disunited with himself. He cannot be a naturalist until he satisfies all the demands of the spirit. Love is as much its demand as perception. Indeed, neither can be perfect without the other. In the uttermost meaning of the words, thought is devout, devotion is thought. Emerson. Deep calls unto deep, but in actual life, the marriage is not celebrated. There are innocent men who worship God after the tradition of their fathers, but their sense of duty has not yet extended to all their faculties. That is, they are not critical about science and philosophy. They do not criticize their own religion. And there are patient naturalists, but they freeze their subject under the wintry light of the understanding, that is, divorce it from religion. Is not prayer also a study of truth, a sally of the soul into the unfound infinite? No man ever prayed heartily without learning something. But when a faithful thinker, resolute to detach every object from personal relations and see it in the light of thought, shall at the same time kindle science with the fire of the holiest affections, then will God go forth anew into the creation. So, he's a prophet of, Tiar de Chardin, one can say, of a person who discovers science and religion are once more compatible. Dabzonsky himself summarizes what Tiar de Chardin tried to do in his books. Tiar de Chardin describes the stages through which evolutionary development goes and he uses technical terms. We'll only use a few of them. He says, First, there is cosmogenesis, the evolution of inanimate nature, that is, the genesis of the cosmos. Second, biogenesis, which means evolution of life. And third, neogenesis, the development of human thought. And he uses those spheres, the words, the biosphere, which means the sphere of life, and there's a noosphere, the sphere of thought. He says the whole of the globe now is being penetrated by a web of thought, which he calls the noosphere. Up to here, says Dobzhansky, Tiard stands firmly on a foundation of demonstrable facts. To complete his theology of nature, he then embarks on prophecy based on his religious faith, emphasis in Christian evolutionism. He speaks of conviction, strictly undemonstrable to science, that the universe has a direction, and that it could, indeed if we are faithful, it should, result in some sort of irreversible perfection. Dobzhansky quotes with approval this statement of Tiar de Chardin about what is evolution. Is evolution a theory, a system, or a hypothesis? It is much more. It is a general postulate to which all theories, all hypotheses, all systems must henceforward bow and which they must satisfy in order to be thinkable and true. Evolution is a light which illuminates all facts, a trajectory which all lines of thought must follow. This is what evolution is. That is, evolution becomes in his thought, which many, many people follow, whether they're Christian or atheist or whatever, it is a kind of new universal revelation for mankind. And everything, including religion, must be understood in terms of evolution. Briefly, the teaching of T.R. de Chardin is this. What inspired him, and inspires his followers today, is a certain unitary view of reality, a joining together of God and the world, of the spiritual and the secular, into a single harmonious and all-encompassing process, which can not only be grappled by the modern intellectual, 
but can be felt by the sensitive soul that is in close contact with the spirit of modern life. Indeed, the next step of the process can be anticipated by the modern man, and that is why Tillard de Chardin is so readily accepted as a prophet, even by people who do not believe in God. He announces it in a very mystical way, the future which every thinking man today, save for conscious Orthodox Christians, hopes for. That is, every person who is in the tradition of rationalism, coming from the age of the Enlightenment and eventually from the Middle Ages. There are two sides to this unitary thought of Tillard de Chardin, the worldly side, by which he attracts and holds even total atheists, such as Julian Huxley, and the spiritual side, by which he attracts Christians and gives a religion to unbelievers. Tillard de Chardin's own words leave no doubt that first and foremost, he was passionately in love with the world, with the earth. He says, The world, its value, its infallibility, and its goodness, that when all is said and done is the first, the last, and the only thing in which I believe. Again, he says, Now the earth can certainly clasp me in her giant arms. She can swell me with her life, or take me back into her dust. She can deck herself out for me with every charm, with every horror, with every mystery. She can intoxicate me with her perfume of tangibility and unity. He said, Salvation was no longer to be sought in abandoning the world, but now in active participation in building it up. He was against the old forms of Christian spirituality. He disdained. All those goody-goody romances about the saints and the martyrs. Whatever normal child would want to spend an eternity in such boring company? This is a Jesuit priest. What we are all more or less lacking at this moment is a new definition of holiness. The modern world is a world in evolution. Hence, the static concepts of the spiritual life must be rethought and the classical teachings of Christ must be reinterpreted. Of course, this is a reflection of the overthrowing of the old universe of Newton. And with that, he wants to put Christianity into the same category, because it also is bound up with the classical static way of thinking. Now we have a new way of thinking, and therefore, just as we have a new physics, we must also have a new Christianity. The most powerful vision of Père Teilhard de Chardin is this idea of spiritualization of the world and worldly activity. He was not merely in love with the world and all modern progress and scientific development. His distinguishing mark was that he gave these things a distinctly religious significance. As he even writes himself, Then it is really true, Lord, by helping on the spread of science and freedom, I can increase the density of the divine atmosphere in itself as well as for me, that atmosphere in which it is always my one desire to be immersed. By laying hold of the earth, I enable myself to cling closely to you. May the world's energies, mastered by us, bow down before us and accept the yoke of our power. May the race of men, grown to fuller consciousness and great strength, become grouped into rich and happy organisms which life shall be put to better use and bring in a hundredfold return. I am not speaking metaphorically, he says, when I say that it is throughout the length and breadth and depth of the world in movement that man can attain the experience and vision of his God. The time is past, he says, 
in which God could simply impose himself on us from without, as master and owner of the estate. Henceforth the world will kneel down only before the organic center of its own evolution. Christianity and evolution are not two irreconcilable visions, but two perspectives destined to fit together and complement each other. Evolution has come to infuse new blood, so to speak, into the perspectives and aspirations of Christianity. The earth, he says, can cast me to my knees in expectation of what is maturing in her breast. She has become for me over and above herself, the body of him who is and of him who is coming, the divine milieu. T.R. de Chardin as to what was backing him. We should keep in mind that he is not at all some kind of exception, some kind of outsider of Roman Catholic tradition. He had some extremely traditional piety. For example, he was extremely devoted to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and he has the following mystical meditation upon it. Two centuries ago, O God, your church, that is Roman Catholicism, began to feel the particular power of your heart. Now we are becoming aware that your main purpose in this revealing to us of your heart was to enable our love to escape from the constrictions of the too narrow, too precise, too limited image of you which we had fashioned for ourselves. What I discern in your breast is simply a furnace of fire, and the more I fix my gaze on its ardency, the more it seems to me that all around it the contours of your body melt away and become enlarged beyond all measure, till the only features I can distinguish in you are those of the face of a world which has burst into flame. A person who is meditating on the Sacred Heart next begins to meditate upon evolution, which is a further development of the same direction. In fact, we didn't go into the Catholic mystics, but undoubtedly if we looked into them, we could find all sorts of parallels to what is happening in this scientific, rationalistic world. They are all preparing us for the same thing, chiliasm. Evolution for Teilhard de Chardin is a process which is building up the cosmic body of Christ, in which all things are united with God. His most striking idea, which is actually a kind of new development in Catholic thought, something like the development of the Sacred Heart in piety, is his idea of the transubstantiation of the earth, which he wrote when he was in the Chinese desert near the Gobi Desert, in the 20s or 30s, and he has a little article called The Mass on the World. He celebrates the Mass in this desert. As our humanity assimilates the material world, and as the host, that is the Roman Catholic host, assimilates our humanity, the Eucharistic transformation goes beyond and completes the transubstantiation of the bread on the altar. Step by step, it irresistibly invades the universe. The sacramental species are formed by the totality of the world, and the duration of the creation is the time needed for its consecration. In this process of evolution, the body of Christ is being formed in the world, not the Christ of orthodoxy, but the universal Christ or super Christ, as he says. The super Christ is defined by Teilhard as the synthesis of Christ and the universe. This evolving Christ will bring about the unity of all religions. As he says, quote, a general convergence of religions upon a universal Christ who fundamentally satisfies them all. This seems to me the only possible conversion of the world, and the only form in which a religion of the future can be conceived. Thus, for Teilhard de Chardin, 
Christianity is not unique truth, but it is rather, as he says, an emerging phylum of evolution, subject to change and transformation like everything else in the evolving world. Even like recent popes, he does not wish to convert the world, but only to offer the papacy as the kind of mystical center of man's religious quest, a super-denominational Delphic oracle. As one of his admirers summarizes his view, if Christianity is indeed to be the religion of tomorrow, there is only one way in which it can hope to come up to the measure of today's great humanitarian trends and assimilate them, and that is through the axis, living and organic, of its Catholicism centered on Rome. At the same time that the universe is evolving into the body of Christ, according to Teilhard de Chardin, man himself is reaching the pinnacle of his evolutionary development, which is called superhumanity. He says, If the evidence obliges our reason to accept that something greater than the man of today is in gestation upon the earth, in order to be able to continue worship as before, we must be able to say to ourselves, as we look at the Son of Man, not apparuit humanitas, but apparuit superhumanitas. Let superhumanity appear. Humanity would reach a point of development when it would detach itself altogether from the earth and unite with Omega, a phenomenon outwardly similar to death perhaps, but in reality simple metamorphosis and accession to the supreme synthesis. That is, this new state which is coming. He calls it the Omega Point, the point to which all the creation now is ascending. One day, the Gospel tells us, the tension gradually accumulating between humanity and God will reach the limits prescribed by the possibilities of the world, and then will come the end. Then the presence of Christ, which has been silently accruing in things, will suddenly be revealed, like a flash of light from pole to pole. The spiritual atoms of the world will be borne along by a force generated by the powers of cohesion proper to the universe itself, and will occupy, whether within Christ or without Christ, but always under the influence of Christ, the place of happiness or pain designated for them by the living structure of the pleroma, the fullness of things. The climax of evolution is identified with the risen Christ of the parousia. All men, Teilhard believes, must desire this goal, for it is an accumulation of desires that should cause the pleroma to burst upon us. And he says, to cooperate in total cosmic evolution is the only deliberate act that can adequately express our devotion to an evolutive and universal Christ. The unique business of the world is the physical incorporation of the faithful in Christ, who is of God. This major task is pursued with the rigor and harmony of a natural process of evolution. Of course, he is completely doing away with all ideas of Christianity which have been hitherto. Christianity is not an individual trying to save his soul. It is everybody in the world evolving by a natural process up to the omega point. Though frightened for a moment by evolution, he says, the Christian now perceives that what it offers him is nothing but a magnificent means of feeling more at one with God, and of giving himself more to him. In a pluralistic and static nature, the universal domination of Christ could, strictly speaking, still be regarded as an extrinsic and superimposed power. But in a spiritually converging world, this Christic energy acquires an urgency and intensity of another order altogether. That is, Christ is not outside saying, Obey me, come to me. 
he is set inside pushing us. There are a few more of the views of Tillard de Chardin that we should mention. In this pamphlet, here's a picture of him, Cross Currents cover, by the way, very intense thinker, which shows his views. Interestingly, he looks for a state which will take us beyond the dead end of communism. In fact, the three, he wrote this apparently during the war, communism, fascism, and democracy, they're all fighting each other. He says we must go beyond that. The great affair for modern mankind, he says, is to break its way out by forcing some threshold of greater consciousness. Whether Christians or not, the men who are animated by this conviction form a homogenous category. The great event which we are awaiting is this, the discovery of a synthetic act of adoration in which are allied and mutually exalted the passionate desire to conquer the world and the passionate desire to unite ourselves with Christ, the vital act, specifically new, corresponding to a new age of the earth. By the way, you can see how chiliasm is very strong. The new age comes out. In communism, at any rate in its origins, faith in a universal human organism reached a magnificent state of exaltation, perhaps because this is something which is headed toward the millennium. On the other hand, it is unbalanced admiration for the tangible powers of the universe. Communism has systematically excluded from its hopes the possibility of a spiritual metamorphosis of the universe. So if you add spirituality to communism, it's the answer. We must unite, no more political fronts, but one great crusade for human advancement. The Democrat, the Communist, and the Fascist must jettison the deviations and limitations of their systems and pursue to the full the positive aspirations which inspire their enthusiasm. And then, quite naturally, the new spirit will burst the exclusive bonds which still imprison it. The three currents will find themselves merging in the conception of a common task, namely to promote the spiritual future of the world. The function of man is to build and direct the whole of the earth. We shall end by perceiving that the great object unconsciously pursued by science is nothing else than the discovery of God. That's how mysticism comes right into the middle of science. And of course, what's in science nowadays is losing all of its bearings. It's become indeterminate. It's a whole universe of antimatter, which mixes them all up. It all ends in mysticism. The only truly natural and real human unity, he says, is the spirit of the earth. The only truly natural and real human unity, he says, is the spirit of the earth. A conquering passion begins to show itself, which will sweep away or transform what has hitherto been the immaturity of the earth. The call towards the great union, whose realization is the only business now afoot in nature. He means the universal unity of mankind. The sense of earth is the irresistible pressure which will come at the right moment to unite them in a common passion. The age of nations is past. The task before us now, if we would not perish, is to shake off our ancient prejudices and to build the earth. The great conflict from which we shall have emerged will merely have consolidated in the world the need to believe. Having reached a higher degree of self-mastery, the spirit of earth will experience an increasingly vital need to adore. Out of universal evolution, God emerges. Emphasis in original. In our consciousness, as greater and more necessary than ever. We have an urgent need to find a faith, a hope to give meaning and soul 
to the immense organism we are building. This, of course, means what this whole modern revolution needs. It's lost itself. It finds when it tries to build a new paradise, it destroys everything, and what is needed is a religious meaning to it. And this he gives. So all the things in modern life are good. Only add to them this, that they're heading for some kind of spiritual kingdom, new kingdom. We cannot yet understand exactly where this will all lead us, but it would be absurd for us to doubt that it would lead us toward some end of supreme value. In this he's really, he's a prophet, but he's not really quite sure where it's all going. The generating principle of our unification is not finally to be found in the single contemplation of the same truth, or in the single desire awakened by something, but in the single attraction exercised by the same someone. That is, we are striving towards worshipping someone. Therefore, in spite of all the apparent improbabilities, we are inevitably approaching a new age in which the world will cast off its chains, to give itself up, at last, to the powers of its internal affinities. With 2,000 years of mystic experience behind us, of Roman Catholicism, the contact which we can make with the personal focus of the universe has gained just as much explicit richness as the contact we can make after 2,000 years of science with the natural spheres of the world. Regarded as a phylum of love, Christianity is so living that at this very moment we can see it undergoing an extraordinary mutation by elevating itself to a firmer consciousness of its universal value. Is there not now underway one further metamorphosis, the ultimate, the realization of God at the heart of the noosphere, the mental world, the passage of the circles, of all the spheres, to their common center, the apparition at last of the theosphere, when man and the world become God? This is very deep in modern man, because this is what he wants. All these philosophical, chiliastic, socialistic systems all have as their end the idea that God is thrown out. Christianity is thrown out. The world is divine. The world is somehow the body of God, and man wants to be a God. And now he's lost God. God is dead. The Superman wants to be born, and he's the one who, being a scientist at the same time, is a mystic. That is, he's trying to unite what we saw, this desire for the Grand Inquisitor, the spiritual side and the scientific side, the union of religion and science, and of course a new order which will be political, and he's a prophet of Antichrist. And so with this, modern rationalism in our time comes to an end. Reason finally comes to doubt or even to deny itself. Science is upset, does not know what is, what it can know, what it cannot know. Every place there is relativism. And we saw already this morning about the philosophy of the absurd. And it turns out that going through all those experiments of the apostasy Man cannot develop anything for himself. He tried everything, and each time he was confident that he had finally found the answer. He overthrew more and more from the past. And always, whatever he made was overthrown by the next generation. And now he comes finally to doubting even whether the world exists, whether he, what he is. Many people commit suicide. Many destroy. And what is left for man? There's nothing left except to wait for a new revelation. And man is in such a state. He has no value system. He has no religion of his own that he cannot but accept whatever comes as this new revelation. Tomorrow we'll take one last look at the prospects for the new revelation. 
and the striving of mankind for this new revelation. About Teilhard de Chardin, we can add that his book, The Phenomenon of Man, was published in 1965 in Moscow. The first book of a Christian thinker, except the propaganda volume of the Red Dean of Canterbury, Hewlett Johnson, ever to be published in the USSR. After this publication, Father John Mayendorf of the American Metropolia wrote the following words. The Christocentric understanding of man and the world which, according to Teilhard de Chardin, are in a state of constant change and striving towards the omega point, that is, the highest point of being and evolution, which is identified by the author with God himself, connects Teilhard with the profound intuition of the Orthodox Fathers of the Church. And Nikita writes, it should be noted that the chief characteristic of Teilhardism is not at all the acceptance of evolution. This has not been a novelty for a long time among theologians and religious philosophers. The soul of the teaching of the French thinker is a new approach to the problem of the world and creation. Teilhard de Chardin only sets forth in contemporary language the teaching of the Apostle Paul concerning nature, which is not excluded from the plan of salvation. Father H., pure Orthodox scholar, Father Seraphim, and he even says concerning this mass on the world, where the earth is being evolved into God, he says, In the mass of the world, Teilhard's experiences were for him something like a cosmic liturgy, which is invisibly performed in the world. Here is the very heart of the Teardian proclamation which restores to us the forgotten, immemorably Christian understanding of the universe and the divine incarnation. Precisely it illuminated for Teilhard de Chardin the meaning of evolution as the movement of the whole cosmos toward the kingdom of God, and enabled him to overcome the negative approach to the world which is deeply rooted among Christians. Father H. Now we see who are our enemies. Metropolia, the first enemy. Father Seraphim. And there is a whole article in the Paris newspaper, the Paris, what's it called, Vesnik, by a Polish Orthodox theologian, Father George Klinger, in which he makes T.R. de Chardin a father of the church, in the tradition of the great Orthodox Fathers, who are Montanus, Joachim of Flores, etc. Father Seraphim quotes Father Klinger on page 21 of Christian Evolutionism. Father Teilhard speaks much on the cosmic role of Christ, of the divine milieu, and very little of the Church. In this case, too, he converges with tendencies akin to him in Orthodox theology. In Father Teilhard, the Church is identified with the working of Christ in the cosmos. According to him, through communion of the holy mysteries, the world being sanctified becomes the body of Christ. These thoughts are possibly the profoundest that have ever been said in recent years on the question of the central sacrament of Christianity. Anti-Evolution Points Soul can't be evolved? Paradise doesn't fit evolution? Two different kinds of world? Before and after the fall. Adam, 900 years old. One Adam versus many Adams? Earth and grass before the sun? Rib of Adam? Years, thousands versus millions. Patrici, real or not. Scripture, real or allegorical. This concludes the reading of part three of the evolution lecture of the Orthodox Survival Course by Father Seraphim Rose and Father Pod Mishinsky. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe and click on the notification bell to be notified of anything new I post, and check out my Patreon if you'd like to support me in that way. 
Thank you and God bless.